Hi, this is Henry Covert. I'm back again. Um, another unrehearsed uh, presentation, as you can tell. Um, I'm not going to be doing Flickr Street today. Uh, I'll do another sizable um, treatise on that on camera here in a few days. I'm going to try not to make it I'm going to try to make it much shorter than these 40 minute opuses or that opi that I've been posting. But it's a lot of information to cover and et cetera, et cetera. At some point, I'm also going to do a video about uh, my eBay um, store, just some information and some notes, on, you know, anecdotes, I guess, on how it's been going and uh, et cetera. Um, so, in any case, uh, today, though, I am going to go back to the Blu-rays, and um, I've decided to do, since this is now like my vlog or whatever, V-L-O-G, that's such an awkward word, I'm a vlogger, um, since I've been you know, doing pretty well with the uh, unboxing of different uh, Blu-ray presentations and, and editions, I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> talk about like recent acquisitions uh, to my Blu-ray library, recent purchases. Um, I've been able to get all of these extremely inexpensive uh, for what they're what they are. Um, a couple were given to me by patrons, I guess you could say, and um, a couple of auctions I actually won and got away with some things at very low price. Uh, and um, some things that I had uh, upgraded uh, you know, I had sold the DVD and, uh, in some cases I had sold the DVD of the movie and turned around for the same amount, uh, low or high and bought the Blu-ray of it. So I've been fortunate. So I've got a few like this, um, and I've got a small handful uh, on the way. And then I've got a moratorium on spending, a spending freeze until the November criterion sale or the end of November, uh, after our proto Black Friday sales at my day job, because we're not going to officially roll out a Black Friday um, because of COVID and all the um, madness. Uh, we don't want to risk like this massive outbreak as everybody rushes madly to get their Christmas gifts. Uh, but we're going to stagger it through November and the department I'm in, I'll be able to not only get a lot of work, but also a lot of hours, but also some good commissions. Um, I'm not going to get into all that right now about that job, but and, oh, and it, or my other full time job is at eBay, which is out of my house. This right here is my office, it's technically Flickr Street Studios. Um, it was originally a studio that was being created and put together by me and my ex fiance Kelly. And um, so after she left, I kind of reconverted it, and the very next week I christened it. Flickr Street Studio, and I took pictures of it, and I started a, a kind of a virtual um, christening day, and I had a little help from my official Flickr Street curator, Sean Lee Levin, and so he's like the man Friday of Flickr Street, and uh, basically, uh, in the last couple of months, out of necessity, uh, I've reconverted uh, I'm not going to turn the camera around to show you because it's kind of a mess on that side, but um, basically it's a wall of items that I'm selling uh, on my eBay, in my eBay store. Um, so anyway, that's where I am now. So technically right now I'm in the eBay store. <laughs> so in the next video, it could be a, a totally different construct. So anyway, to go on, I'm going to go over some recent video on um, our Blu-ray releases um what i thought about the movies uh seeing them for the first time if, if that was the case or re-watching them revisiting them if that was the case and uh the blu-rays themselves you know the presentation the uh prints you know how they look how they stack up so <clears throat> i'm just going to do a small handful this time and continue uh, next week um but i'll show you each one cover wise anyway um the first one uh, i received not long ago this one is called Cooley High. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of it and or seen it. Believe it or not, I had never seen this until a week ago. So 
uh, I didn't. I knew kind of that it was the inspiration for the uh, television series What's Happening, which was very popular when I was in school, and um, I loved that show. I thought it was hilarious. I'm not sure how it would hold up today, but I, I kind of feel like some of it would, some of it would not. Um, I didn't realize or remember that Cooley High, the film, is a period piece. It's actually set in 1964, and it's an all-black cast. It's basically an all-black school because, you know, you're, you're hitting it in 64, so the Civil Rights Act is just passing, but, you know, the schools aren't going to be integrated for a few more years. So you've got a black school, and it's kind of some of the students are on the poor side. Uh, a lot of them are on maybe the lower middle class to middle class side. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, but they seem to be, you know, uh, some of our main characters, mainly our major main character, seems to be doing okay. However, toward the end of the film, we find out his mother has three jobs, and she's about to kill over dead, supporting him and his two little sisters. Um, they later retooled that to where she's, uh, she's still like an overweight lady working a couple of jobs and uh, she has the main character as her son but she only has they combined they conflated the two little sisters the older little sister and then the baby sister named D into a kind of a preteen character named D and in the series our main guy became known as Roger or Raj so what struck me beyond the fact that it influenced that show and, and such is it itself is seems strongly influenced by Happy Days. It's like a black Happy day, Happy Days, and I mean it's it's in my opinion superior to Happy Days because uh, you know when I revisited that show briefly in the last several years, it to, to me it, it just did not hold up. That's just me though. I'm sure Fonzie fanatics are going to be hurling epithets at me in the comment section, but I just couldn't get into it. But I liked it a lot as a kid. I didn't like it a lot as much as some of my classmates did, you know, they thought Fonzie was kind of God. They also, you know, loved Kiss and Star Wars and a lot of the stuff that was trendy, you know, when I was very young, like a little kid. And I would like get into that stuff briefly or whatever and get kind of burnt out on it. I didn't know the word commercial back then, but it was, they were too commercial for me. And that's kind of how I felt about Happy Days and some of those series that I, you know, liked in elementary school or junior high, they kind of grated on my nerves by the time I, I was, uh, you know, maybe 14, 15. I mean, at age 16, I, I took my television out of my room and gave it to my mom. I mean, it's hers anyway. And uh, just cranked the stereo all the time and read. And I didn't watch television again. I don't think I, other than soap operas, I was addicted to them. So I'd watch them in the living room. But other than soap operas, I don't think I watched any television until I happened into the living room in 1990, early 1990, I guess. Um, and it was Twin Peaks. And my mom was watching it and she'd been watching it from the beginning. She liked it because it, she loves mystery, loved mysteries and soap operas. But, you know, the more occult and supernatural and absurdist it got, um, it lost her. She, like a lot of people uh, her age that I knew who, who enjoyed it, thought David Lynch was, quote unquote, jerking us around, manipulating us, dicking us around, uh, masturbating, you know, and basically not giving them what they wanted, which was a solution to the mystery. Ironically, though, he did give them that uh, about halfway through season two. And he was not intending to ever do that. That was network pressure. So these people kind of got what they want, but by the time they got it, uh, they were kind of, they were, they'd lost interest. So you alienated two factions uh, of fan bases back then. I saw that episode where the killer is revealed, uh, Laura's killer. I won't reveal it now. I won't give you the spoilers because if you still haven't seen it, you really need to see it. Twin Peaks. It's an experience. It's my favorite television series of all time, and I have a number of friends uh, and acquaintances who it's also their favorite television series of all time. Um, but in any case, we weren't really talking about Twin Peaks, but we we're kind of talking about television and, you know, how certain things uh, feed into other things. And that was the case with this uh, film. Remind you what we were talking about, Ryan, myself, uh, Cooley High. 
<clears throat> like I said, it was influenced by Happy Days, and you know, it's a it's a pretty nice script. It's kind of funny. It's it's you know, it's it's not so silly that it's unbelievable or ridiculous. Uh, it's more grounded uh, than Happy Days. It's more grounded than some other uh, black exploitation comedies of the era. For, you know, like Dolomite is. Dolomite is in another whole realm there. You know, it, it doesn't have a lot of this kitsch value. Uh, it's a more serious minded, even though it's ridiculous. Uh, it's all believable things that could really happen um, to these mischievous kids. And I've been watching it and the main character is played by Glenn Turman, who is one of my favorite actors. I love him. His character's named Preach, who was retooled into Raj for what's happening now. And Preach is... He's like this bespectacled kind of nerd guy. But, you know, I was expecting going into it that he was going to be more like Roger and he was going to be that way and have bad luck with women and, you know, be kind of the likable, sweet guy compared to his you know, mischievous friends. But actually, in the film, Breach is really mischievous and kind of sexist uh, himself and, and chauvinistic with women he pretty much will do anything to get laid and he lies constantly. It's like part of his personality, but unlike in a sitcom where you can kind of nudge wink at the audience every week, Oh, Roger's in trouble again. And how he told a lie. I'm going to tell mama. It's, it's not like that. It's kind of like, damn dude, why are you, why are you telling, why are you doing this? Do you really think this is going to help you? So, and maybe that's because it is more grounded in reality. So it kind of takes you off guard. And so he and his main buddy, um, his uh, character is played by Lawrence Hilton Jacobs, who around that time, uh, I believe, uh, had a supporting role in Welcome Back, Cotter, and then went on to do some other films starring himself, like Young Blood, uh, a later black exploitation, really good film. Um, but anyway, this was uh, the two of them and their relationship, and that there there is a contrast between the two guys, though. But it's more subtle and not as marked as I was expecting it to be. There's more, I guess you could say, more nuance. Um, again, you know, Roger, he's, he falls in love with, uh, as they put it, a high yellow, uh, beauty. And, you know, that, that's essentially a, a very light skinned African American girl. And, you know, as to be expected, uh, from a lot of mixed race people, she's extremely beautiful. Her features are very distinctive and, you know, she's kind of like the prize that preach is trying to obtain and he keeps fucking himself up and putting his foot in his mouth because he insists on lying to get out of a situation and that puts him in even more hot water. So, but again, every time it gets on the edge of seeming like, you know, a ridiculous kind of hackneyed comedy where it's like a stereotype, a cliche, it's just like, oh God, what's he going to do now? Um, there's a lot of sincerity in Terman's performance and in um, the young lady's performance uh, who plays the character Brenda that he's in love with. And, uh, you know, essentially, I, I've kind of forgotten the name of this actress already. I feel I feel really horrible. Uh, Cynthia Davis. This was her debut. And from what I've read, she didn't really do much else after this. Um, so she's really just known for being beautiful Brenda in this film. And her acting's great, you know. Uh, but So she's kind of iconic among uh, the black cinema just for this part. Uh, but I, I couldn't find her really that she had a, a much of a career after. And I think she might even be deceased, but I, I can't, I haven't been able to verify that. That's a rumor. Anyway, getting back to the, the story itself, I don't want to give too much away, but as the film wanes, um, it changes tone like drastically toward the very end and becomes a, a drama, somber almost, almost to the point where it's a different film altogether. But I think that's what they've been building toward, the punchline of having this grounded um, scenario, and finally it pays off with these are real people, and it's not just fun and games in high school. That there's real problems they really do grapple with, you know, um, poverty and, uh, you know, personal issues and uh, violence and various things, the law and various problems, and that, Preach can't always just make a funny joke and tell a quick lie to get out of things. Sometimes he really fucks things up and it has just literally life altering uh, repercussions. So anyway, I really enjoyed the movie. Uh, it took me until uh, two thirds of the film to really kind of connect 
with it again because I was expecting it to be different than it was, but very rewarding. Uh, Olive Films, they're putting out some incredible titles on Blu-ray, just like they did on DVD, but their stuff is very bare bones. I mean, you've got the movie. It's beautiful. It's remastered, you know, 2K, 4K. It's gorgeous. But that's all you have. You don't have trailers. You don't have interviews. You don't have any of this stuff. You know, they're not exactly uh, Arrow or, or Severin or, or Criterion. Um, but, you know, they have great titles, and they're pretty affordable. This one was uh, used like new, but, you know, I'll be honest, I got it for $10, um, all told, uh, from an eBay dealer. I think if it had been a more popular title or a more or a more tricked out kind of edition, like a Criterion or whatever, that yeah, I probably would have paid a lot more. But but for what it is, you know, I guess they figured you know, that's a decent you know use, but like new price and it's great condition, beautiful. It's probably a movie I'll be revisiting, and a lot of it really boils down to Glenn Turman because I love him in JD's Revenge, um, I love him in Gremlins, which he's mostly known for. I loved him in the television series Centennial. He was the only major black character in that entire miniseries. Everyone else was white or uh, Native American or white playing many Native American. And that's a, a fantastic miniseries and novel. I talked a little about that on my well, last Spicker Street video about Missioner and uh, James A. Missioner and the Centennial kind of uh, saga. Because it influenced my writing a lot. But anyway, he was in it. And uh, he's been in a number of other things, but those are some of the major high points. J.D.'s Revenge is uh, one of my very favorite uh, black exploitation horror films. Uh, it's up there with like Sugar Hill, and not quite up there with Ganja and Hess, but you know it's in that it's in that league. It's better than Sugar Hill. I mean, and I love Sugar Hill, but J.D.'s Revenge is just really underrated and brilliantly made. But anyway, so I believe the director of Cooley High also directed Car Wash, which again. Shamedly, I have never seen. I saw a clip of it on TV when I was a kid because Richard Pryor was huge at that time. Uh, I'll eventually see it. I think George Carlin is in it also. Don't throw tomatoes at the screen for me not being certain of these facts. Uh, but I'm pretty good on other things. Okay, so this is the second one I watched recently, and this is a film that I've loved since uh, I first rented it in one of these giant... Uh, clamshell boxes from Wizard Video around 1990, oh, I don't know, four, I guess, and, or three, yeah, 1993, and I had been into the director, but I'd only seen about three, four, or five of his movies that I'd rented at Blockbuster, and definitely a director that changed my view of cinema, and a lot of the people in my life at that time thought his movies were very funny and entertaining, uh, but then uh, my then, my then best friend uh, and roommate, he you know, derided it as just crummy, black, uh, bad cinema, just known for, you know, being a landmark in certain ways. But overall, he was a hack filmmaker, a terrible Ed Wood level uh, of, of, of creator. But anyway, it's Herschel Gordon Lewis. And the first one I saw was 2000 Maniacs. And man, I was just, even though it was ridiculous and was kitschy, um, it was pretty sadistic. And I enjoyed it. I, I loved everything about it. I thought, those films have a charm while still being really hardcore. I mean, I don't know if anyone else has been able to strike that balance. There have been people who have tried. Um, certainly Joel M. Reed with Blood Sucking Freaks, which a lot of people love. I'm not that big a fan of it. I respect Reed, but and he passed recently. Um, but I think he's just really trying to be HG, and he, he can't do it. He just can't do it. Um the other people in that league who are kind of lumped in together with Lewis, especially in books like Incredibly Strange Films and, and uh, you know, cult movie books and magazines, uh, they're still kind of, they're not, they're a little different. They're just like Al Adamson and Ted V. Michaels, Ray Dennis Steckler. I tend to throw them into one kind of lot of really fun, kitschy, multi-genre films that are kind of a mess, that are kind of slapped together, but uh, still have some craft to them. Uh, Graydon Clark, I guess, is another one of that nature. Uh, but uh, and some of those guys all work together, you know. But H.G. is was before the broke before them in 1963 with Blood Feast, the first, well, the first American gore film. Uh, it was the second really notable gore film. The first was Jigoku uh, or Japanese Hell from 1960, um, Japanese film, and 
by Nakagwa, and that is really, oh my god, it's it's really as graphic as HG, and and actually a little bit more uh, so surreal that it's actually a little bit more a bit more frightening. Uh, and then a contemporary of HG's, you know, not in America, was uh, Jose Mojica Marines and Coffin Joe's, Edo Kaishan, and his stuff wasn't quite as graphic as those guys, but it was so sadistic. It was probably the most sadistic stuff other than that Japanese film until HG kind of took the crown for the sadism and the gore. But still, it's like there's this wholesome, weird quality to it, to his movies. So the one that I rewatched was one I obtained very cheaply. A friend of mine uh, purchased it for me, actually, and it is called The Wizard of Gore. And to me, this is this is HG's masterpiece. I mean, because by this time he had refined this kind of formula and anything could happen in his movies anyway. Sometimes, a lot of times by accident, he probably didn't plan it that way, but it's still always entertaining and crazy off the wall. Even the kind of duller movies that he made that are different genres that aren't like horror or action or whatever, um, you know, like uh, redneck uh, exploitation films and, you know, uh, a girly kind of, um, you know, nudie cutie kind of films. Even they have twists and turns in them, uh, at least a scene or two that are just hysterical. Moonshine Mountain comes to mind because it's just, it, it's ridiculous. But anyway, um, Wizard of Gore was after he had done several gore films, a uh, trilogy of gore films, and then he'd also followed those up with like the gruesome twosome. And um, he had also done, uh, uh, it's called um, The Taste of Blood, I believe. I own it. I bootleg of it. I only saw it for the first time last year. Um, but it was his long, it's like his epic. It's like almost two hours long. Better production values than a lot of his other films, maybe than any of his films. And I've heard a rumor that it was like his calling card to Roger Corman. And then Corman may have seen it or heard about it and was interested in hiring him on to maybe do something, but. H.G. was insistent on being totally independent, 100%. Now, I don't know how much of all that is completely true, but I do think that that does ring true to me, that scenario. So anyway, after he'd done a few of these, he, he dove really hard into this, 1971, with um, The Wizard of Gore. And, you know, it is an unbelievable experience. Uh, it's extremely grotesque, and... Um, you know, essentially, uh, he does a lot of things that he had never done before. Uh, takes everything to the limit: chainsaws and, and and swords and punch presses, anything he can find to uh, mutilate these these poor young women. But it's all under the the guise of a magician called Montag, and Montag is quite a character. He speaks very loudly throughout the entire movie or he speaks very kind of pretentiously so he's really he's really a bizarre and fascinating character i mean and and you see an interview on the in the blu-ray with the new, the guy who played him as he is now and he's aged very well and he of course he acts and speaks nothing remotely like montag and, and he wasn't originally cast as montag it was a much older gentleman who was going to play this kind of warped mu magician who does these magician tricks on stage, like cutting women in half and putting the swords through them, except he like does it for real. And the audience is like, oh my God, he's he's really doing this gory stuff, but the women are surviving, you know, and, but actually they're not seeing the illusion. I mean, they were seeing an illusion and actually they, he really has damaged them. Uh, they don't die immediately though. They kind of go into a trance and then the effects of what he did to them sets in like a few minutes or hours later it's very odd and then he starts stealing their bodies from the mausoleum um this movie is surreal and i believe that's very deliberate it's a pretty intelligent script i mean some of the acting is just unbelievably flat and awful uh mainly mainly the main care main protagonist uh her boyfriend is just he's terrible but you know it's cute it's funny he has that romantic byplay in a lot of his movies, HG, and uh, he really perfected it with the, the Gore Gore Girls after this, uh, which is as gory, if not arguably more gory than Wizard of Gore. But with a title like that, how can you not be 
uh, the apex of, of violence and, and carnage. Uh, I love this movie, and this is the Arrow Blu-ray once again. They did an amazing job. You know, they did a whole box. The Herschel Gordon Lewis Beast has all his films. I'm pretty sure almost every one of his films uh, in this one Blu-ray box set. And so it was, I don't know, two, three, four hundred dollars. Now it's out of print, and it's going for up to a thousand on eBay. I'm gonna skip it because, yeah, thousand dollars, no. But the cool thing is. The discs, you know, have one of the lead films, and, and you know, a better known one, like in this case, The Wizard of War, and then they'll have a one of his lesser known kind of kitschy little films, uh, like in, in this case, How to Make a Doll, which is a ridiculous science fiction movie, and it seems like it's totally improvised, but again, there's an intelligence to it, like H.G. himself narrates it, and he's he's making fun of academia, and he's making fun of scientists, and the mating ritual, and... It's just so thoughtful. It's just like a different time when these kind of films, no matter how cheap and bargain basement they were, had a, a literacy to them and a, 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 I don't want to say gravitas to them. Um, they kind of went away as time went on. I mean, there were people obviously who totally perfected that kind of combination like George Romero I mean, his, and David Cronenberg. But that's like on a whole nother level kind of thing. But as far as the lower budget, really gory films, I think a lot of the people that came after HG lacked his true wit, lacked his intellect. His uh, he, They weren't as distinguished uh, and professional and intelligent as he is. And when I say professional, I mean, he he's mainly, he's not just known for making these films and for being the first gore director, but he marketed the hell out of them. And that is really what broke them through. And he would go to towns in the South and four-wall them himself with producer Dave Friedman. And the, the Gore trilogy, the original one, the Blood trilogy, uh, you know, um, 2000 Maniacs and uh, Color Me Blood Red um, and Blood Feast being the first, they, they, they came to Charlotte quite a bit. I mean, it was before I was born, but I, I know a couple of people who didn't meet them but were aware of this. And then I read a few interviews with, Friedman and Lewis, and yeah, that Charlotte was one of the main places they would bring prints of this film and four-wall them and have some audience. But I do know people who saw Blood Feast in the, the theater, I believe the drive-in, when it was new. They're very young, and it kind of scarred their minds. And, I mean, they're cool people, but, you know, who knows what, what it did to them. And um, so I have the benefit of hindsight. You know, I didn't get into this guy until, you know, much later in my life than, than my friends uh, of, who were children in the 60s did. Um, but in any case, I highly recommend this purchase. I think the regular price purchase for just this is probably like $30 or so, but I lucked out uh, and I found it for $15 used like new on Blu-ray and I, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, I need to get this soon. And then a friend of mine was like, oh, I'll get it for you. And I was like, oh, cool, man, thanks. Uh, dear friend, and uh, I'll, I think I'll just pay him back soon anyway and or buy him something. Um, but so this is a gem of my Blu-ray library. So, okay, the next movie uh, is probably the most, well, is not, is the most mainstream of the films I'll be talking about today. And the next is the last one. Uh, this is The Rose by Mark Rydell, starring Bette Midler. And this is when Bette Midler was just amazing. She was funny incredibly good dramatic actress proven in this film she was incredibly sexy and stylish and in real life very irreverent and wild and her character in this movie is very irreverent and wild. she's based on Janis Joplin and Rose is an amazing character uh, I saw this movie on TV when I was a child and I loved it I thought it was really sad and tragic and I liked the music my mom bought the soundtrack on vinyl and I used to listen to the title song to Rose and When a Man Loves a Woman, their version over and over and over again. And then my mom gave me the album when I moved out and, you know, eventually it got sold with all my vinyl, you know, in the 90s. But in any case, uh, but I remembered it in those terms. I remembered it as being a good film, but mainstream. It didn't, it wasn't the kind of cinema I was, you know, looking for as I got older. But I'd heard it was coming out on Criterion a couple of years ago and I was like, hmm. I'd like to revisit this and see how they handled this. And I, I ordered it on DVD. It was about 
four or five years ago, right around the time I moved into this house I'm living in now. And I kind of wish I'd bought the Blu-ray then, but back then I was still being very judicious about Blu-rays because the prices were so high. Um, so I picked up the DVD and I, I loved it. I, I think it's an incredible film, very well made. It is tragic. It does have some humor. It does have some great music. And um, it really charts the, the, the trajectory of this character, the Rose, and her fall and decline due to drugs and, and depression and, uh, you know, aborted romances. And it's rough, man. It's really rough. And people like Alan Bates is her manager. He tries to help her. Frederick Forrest is her boyfriend. He tries to help her, but she's just, no, she's gone. So anyway, I love this, The Rose. I highly recommend it for people who like drama or sort of music bio kind of things. And Criterion did a beautiful job. It's loaded with extras. And, you know, I wondered why it was so beautiful to look at to me now. And I realized I learned that the director of photography was uh, Vilma Sigmund, who's one of the great, you know, uh, Eastern European, uh, you know, uh, cinematographers who came to America in the 60s and uh, had created a, have created a great body of work like Laszlo Kovacs and some of these other guys. So anyway... I would recommend that, but you know, it's not for everybody. It's not a genre movie per se, uh, but Criterion did their usual excellent job. It's beautiful to look at. Packaging's beautiful. I mean, look at this. Okay, before I finish talking about, it. I mean, even this picture, that can you see that? That Midler is just so stunning, and um, it's got like this whole giant fold out kind of thing with all these pictures of her and her concerts. All right, enough of that. I don't want this to look cheap like the old, um, the disc is in my player upstairs, by the way. I don't want this to look like my old son, She Never Slept videos where, you know, we would put things up to the screen and you couldn't make it out and it was like, really embarrassing. The lighting was even worse than this. But I kind of like this fuzzy gold kind of hued lighting. I just think you can make me out now and see me, uh, whereas in the She Never Slept material, there's like three or four of those on my channel here. Uh, you really couldn't see me very well. It was poorly shot and poorly lit, and I was pretty nervous. Um, so I don't know. This is better. I'm not saying I'm great yet, but I feel like, yeah, I can do this. This is fine. I can just talk to you guys conversationally, like you're sitting here with me, or like I'm, I don't know, having like a little seminar on movies, and, you know, I'm not sure if I'm of that caliber of knowledge to, to claim such a thing though i have had a lot of people tell me i should do such a thing but you know i don't have the accredited accreditization that's not a word you know i'm not accredited i don't have a degree that says a piece of paper that says this guy knows film school film studies he knows his shit it's just all i'm an autodidact in all things i didn't finish college anyway let's get to our last movie because this one is harrowing as hell this is one I, I've owned for years on DVD, and this is another one. This is one that I lucked out, and I was able to sell my DVD copy and receive this at a discounted price. A guy saw that I was um, watching it, and he offered me a really low price, and so I picked it up. And same with The Rose. The Rose, I sold the DVD for $15, and I turned around the same day, and this young lady had it for 20 and I just threw this $15 offer at her, and she accepted. So it was like a just an even trade. Um, this is an incredible movie. It's called Flavia the Heretic. It has many titles over the years. Uh, Flavia, Priestess of Violence, and uh, oh my God, Rebel Nun, and oh my Lord, there's just so many. But basically, it is like what you call a nun exploitation film. It's like Post the Devils, which was really the landmark film that was not only commercially huge, but was also um, very notorious and shocking as hell, and still is. The Devils is, you know, I wish that were on Blu-ray. I'd be talking about it probably right now, but I did rewatch it recently, and it has lost none of its power. In the wake of that, you had a bunch of ones that were kind of sadistic and exploitative, like Mark of the Devil. And again, some people swear by those films. They don't do very much for me, but you would occasionally have some people like Bruno Mattai who would do some amusing non-exploitation. Actually, his non-exploitation films are more serious than his other films, which are mostly like pastiche uh, knockoffs of American genre films, but they're absolutely hysterical. 
Um, but his non-exploitation, so like he seems like he's actually trying to tell the story and be pretty clear and 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 make some kind of point. Um, but again, he's kind of like H.G. was. He's his scripts, however absurd they are, they were intelligent. You know, he he would he would create these amazing concepts that he would base on Hollywood films, but he would take them somewhere else. And it's almost like wow, if the script was reshot like as a serious, sobering film, like like a George Romero film. It would be amazing, and but it's funny because George Romero is someone he's ripped off uh, incredibly huge amounts. Like uh, Hell of the Living Dead it is a, a knock on uh, Dawn of the Dead, as well as on Fulci Zombie, which also was a knock on Dawn of the Dead. They're nothing like it, really, other than zombies. Anyway, Flavio the Heretic. Here it is, and here's the back. So it doesn't have many extras. I think it has some trailers, but it is a beautiful remastered anamorphic widescreen and. I'll just tell you a little bit about it and wrap this uh, segment up. It's Florinda Balkan, who's probably my favorite. She's not from Europe originally, but she's my favorite uh, European actress of that era, the late 60s through like mid 80s. Um, that just golden period of, of Italian cinema. And, and she worked in other European uh, venues too, but she was mainly working in Italian cinema. And uh, she worked with, you know, everyone from Fulci to De Sica, and she's just always classy, always beautiful, always intense as hell. I guess one, the, the role at the time she was most known for was in Investigation of a Citizen, uh, Beyond Suspicion or Above Suspicion by Elio Petri, which won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film the year it came out. I think that was 1970, but I may be wrong around that time, starring uh, Gian Marie, Maria Valente, and that's another one I have on Criterion, and it's a beautiful edition. But Florinda plays his bizarre mistress on there, and kind of what catalyzes the main character to uh, hatch this bizarre scheme, you know, where he's going to commit a crime, and he's going to use his own influence. He's, he's just going to sit back and let his influence and power prove that he is a citizen above suspicion, that he even it's like he's trying to get caught, but no one will, no one will listen. They're like, no, this guy he's so respectable, and you know he would never kill somebody. He would never lie about this. It's wild. It's a very cat and mouse with the audience kind of game, and Florinda is just teasing him and kind of almost maniacal and 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 just really entertaining and amusing, but very different than other movies she's in. She's she has a whole gamut. Uh, I mean, she's even in, you know, she has a small role as a, a crazy gypsy motorcyclist in Candy uh, from 1968, which was, you know, a kind of counterculture-ish uh, Hollywood embarrassment movie, had tons of big Hollywood stars, and had a lot of good European supporting stars, and she was one of them. Um, but I think that's the first thing I saw her in ever was Candy. Um, in Flavia, uh, she's a young woman who uh, has gone to the nunnery. Her father was kind of like a, a Christian soldier of some kind, a Catholic. And I guess it was during the Crusades, they were routing the Muslims and uh, pretty rough. So she's very repressed. And um, there goes my cat. You can probably see his tail. Um, basically, uh, she has one friend who's a male, who's a, a Jewish kind of rabbi-like character. They have kind of a chemistry. He's very gentle and kind, but she's still repressed. You know, he doesn't bring it out in her, and, and I don't blame her because he himself is very repressed. Um, but she meets this much older nun played by Maria, Maria Casares, and she is over the top. Maria Casares, in her younger years, is most known for Orpheus or Orfe by Jean Cocteau. She played Death herself and just the original goth chick. She's just incredibly, implacably pale and black clad and austere. And I, I just, that, that movie and that character has had untold influence on, on film and uh, culture and uh, other aspects uh, of goth culture uh, over a period of many years. It came out in 1950. Um, even Kurosawa uh, imitated her look for her, the Setsuko, Setsuko horror character in his The Idiot in 1951. Anyway, so Maria Casares at this point was kind of elderly, but man, she plays this character, and the woman is, she's still a nun. She's been a nun most of her life, but 
She's had a lot of sex. She's obsessed with talking about having sex with men. She's obsessed with talking about masturbation. Uh, she's slamming the church. She's talking about how men are pigs. I mean, she loves having sex with them, but she thinks they're horrible. And, you know, I get it. You know, this is the dichotomy of, of things, and especially in that time, even more than today, um, and especially in that, you know, in the cloisters, you know, come on. Uh, so she's an amazing and irreverent character. Like she urinates in a bed of straw and cackles about it. And she like just talks smack to these, uh, these invaders that come in. And she's just, unfortunately, it leads to her downfall, but she's made a strong impression on Flavia. And Flavia takes a chance on love and sex with one of the Muslims who is uh, gaining revenge on the Catholics. And she becomes a, like his warrior queen. And, but unfortunately he does horrible things that are beyond the pale that she can't, even though she wants revenge against Catholicism, she's not cool with. And he finally does a really horrible act, I must say. Uh, it kind of shocked me, even though I've seen the movie a number of times, it's been a while. And uh, I was like, man, she can't stay with this guy after that. And, and she did it. And unfortunately, then the Catholics come back and reinvade, and she's kind of like a, considered a traitor to the nunnery and to Catholicism. So she has to meet a horrific fate, and it is truly horrific. It, it's brief, that, you know, but it, the movie ends with this horrific, and it's very again, it's very influenced by the devils. Um, this kind of truly righteous character among a bunch of religious hypocrites who is destroyed by them. In, in, in horrible fashion, just like Oliver Reed's Grandier in The Devils. So, poor Florinda. Man, you just never want to see that woman suffer, but, you know, she's so good at suffering. Um, essentially, uh, the last thing I have to say about the movie is kind of tied in with that ending, is that the movie itself is very shocking. You know, I, I forgot how extreme it is, but you know, I think it's from 1974, you know, and it is an Italian uh, production or co-production. And I don't know that it played very widely in America, but it is really, and the, the Italians made a lot of very violent uh, genre films in the 70s. Uh, this was before the cannibal craze, but the Jallos, even then, are many of them are just insanely sadistic, misogynistic, and violent. Um, but this one is like a level of cruelty and sadism, but it works within this story. Like Florinda never compromises her character, you know, and neither really does Maria Casares. Uh, the actors play it pretty straight, uh, even even more so in the, in the Devils, actually, because in the Devils there's quite a bit of camp, even though it is a very grim film um, and a much better made film than Flavia, obviously, but. Still, Flavia is, to me, of the genre after The Devils, to me personally, it's the masterpiece of what they call nunsploitation. Um, unless you count Alucarda as nunsploitation, in which case that's, you know, what could top Alucarda? We'll talk about that another time. Uh, that's not on Blu-ray yet, which is like a crime against all of humanity. But essentially, uh, Flavia is has grotesque, it has like some animal cruelty, which Italians are just really, we're really down with that. Even Italian Americans like Coppola threw like animal cruelty into their movies in the 70s. I, I don't get it. It's like a, in the blood. I don't know. No offense to any Italians watching this, but it was, it was a pretty hard era as far as that goes. So you have to have a strong stomach to watch a lot of these films. Uh, fortunately, I do, even though I grew up very squeamish. I kind of confronted it and then went the other direction. But the extreme stuff bothers me when there's not any context to it, and it's just kind of dull, and it's just like completely self-indulgent. I mean, it can be entertaining, but I'm not an extreme film fan just for the sake of it being extreme. I have some friends who are, and I've had some good close friends who were, but uh, but I still like testing myself and finding more and more disturbing films. It's just a thing of mine, you know, and it doesn't mean uh, some people have mistakenly believed recently that I endorse things depicted in these movies. And I'm like, no, they're fiction. I don't endorse, you know, rape and, and murder and, and, uh, torture, you know, and, um, pedophilia and, you know, um, 
all kinds of insane acts. I don't endorse any of that. That's not how I live my life, and I don't really know anyone personally who does. Uh, but I'm fascinated with that. And in a fictional context, I mean, it's it's really th it, it, drama thrives on conflict. So this is like intense conflict. And, and my own stories uh, overall aren't really extreme, extreme violence and sex wise. But there are those elements in there. They're not for children. Um, so uh, Flavia is like really up high on the rungs of outrageous things happening. You know, it's not quite like the Joe D'Amato level, but it's intense. And sometimes you're like, good Lord. You know, what are they going to do next? And, but it never goes too far to me anyway. It never compromises the character of the story and these uh, messages, the anti clerical messages, the feminist messages. And the end is kind of the most repulsive, but it's not just repulsive because it's so graphic. It's repulsive because something bad is happening to Flavia and you have come to love her throughout this movie because Florinda is just such an amazing. It radiates so much empathy as an actress. Okay, so that's it today. I'm, I'm tired out. It's been a long time uh, that I've been on camera here, but I hope I haven't worn you guys out too much. And I enjoy talking about this stuff, obviously, maybe way too much. Uh, I'll be back and review some more Blu-rays uh, that I've recently acquired, uh, maybe next week sometime. Uh, but my next video will, will be a continuation of Flicker Street, and I doubt it will be as long as this one. But... Um, I doubt it will be as informed or interesting as this one either, but you know, it is my own material. It's my, it's my vlog and Flickr Street is my story. So I just want to kind of connect and introduce people to what I'm doing and put it out there. Um, I want to reach more people with it than I'm able to uh, in other venues. So um, the internet and uh, YouTube and Facebook and things are, are great media that uh, artists, independent artists and writers and filmmakers didn't have when I was growing up. Anyway, take care and I will see you very soon. I really appreciate you watching it. Bye.